Lisa Kersner lives among us here in Atlanta, a graduate of Wellesley College and NYU's Institute of Fine Arts, having studied with Professor Kirk Barnado, who many of us read about in art magazines. We'll have to ask her about that later. That must have been a very cool experience. Um, she's worked at the Metropolitan. She's worked at MoMA. She's worked at the V&A in London in the photography department and has done incredible things here in Atlanta as well. I understand, um, and maybe she'll tell us about it too later, that she's uh, just got the go-ahead, the green light, on a really incredible sounding um, art project here in the Fourth Ward. Um, she's a freelance arts writer for the AJC. She's got regular columns in Atlanta Homes and Lifestyles. And she's, I think what you'll hear from her, is she's an art historian. She's an artist's art historian. Um, she is incredibly uh, passionate about photography and about contemporary art, has worked on a lot of exhibitions, and is very vital in our community with Atlanta Celebrates Photography. So we're really lucky. Um, please join me in welcoming her, Laura, Lisa Kersner. Thanks. Good evening. Um, thank you for letting me take Julian's place tonight. Of course, I'm not a photography curator. I am an art historian with an interest in photography. And as I was thinking about the topic, what always struck me is how Alfred Stieglitz's pictures of O'Keefe were as much about the development of modernism in photography as they were about his investigations of, of his lover and wife. Um, may I have the first slide? And the lights. Thank you. On the left, I'm showing you a portrait of Alfred Stieglitz taken by Edward Steichen in 1911. <clears throat> and on the right, a portrait of Georgia O'Keeffe by Stieglitz in 1919. And um, of course, it's a very glamorous story because, in fact, it was uh, this middle-aged man who had been through uh, a lifetime of art and a marriage who was smitten by this younger artist who rolled in from the uh, plains of Texas around 1916 with some incredibly abstract drawings. And um, that's really what we're going to be looking at. Tonight, I will speak about Alfred Stieglitz's photographs of Georgia O'Keeffe and where this body of work stands in the history of modernism. From the excellent exhibition organized by Kathleen Pyle next door, we have learned much about Stieglitz's relationship with the female avant-garde in New York from the turn of the century to World War II. As a gallerist, essayist, and photographer, Stieglitz had his hand in developing several careers, especially women who had taken up the camera. Besides O'Keeffe, these are Gertrude Kazebier, Pamela Coleman-Smith, Annie Brigman, and Catherine Rhodes Nash. All these artists are featured at one time or another in the publications edited by Stieglitz, camera work, camera notes, and the exhibitions and essays produced at the galleries he stewarded, 291 and American Place, the Anderson Galleries, and the Little Galleries. In American photographic history, the career of Stieglitz is a perfect case study for the rise and development of modernism in the new world, meaning America versus Europe. For photography was born as a medium of modernism in 1839, the bastard child left on the doorstep of art, more a scientific technological wonder and documentation tool for most of the 19th century. Stieglitz, who had mastered the complex chemistry and printing techniques of the, of the pictorialist movement, discovered in his middle age a new pictorial language in his photographs, a language that reflected his absorption of the ideas and images of the European avant-garde that was reaching a sophisticated public in America through his own exhibitions and publications. Stieglitz was from a wealthy German-Jewish family, studied photography and chemistry in Germany, and brought his technical skills back to New York with him. In 1905, with another photographer, Edward Steichen, he opened the little galleries of the photo secession at 291 Fifth Avenue. This small gallery showed photography by an established group of people using processes such as gum bichromate, brome oil, and platinum process to create images that aspire to the painterly and atmospheric effects of oil paint on canvas. 
In craft, subject matter, and presentation, these works were painstakingly self-conscious in their separation from the documentary aspects of the photographic medium. The portrait of O'Keefe on the right, we can see the path from the old to the new. Stieglitz was using a series of single lens reflex, gray flex cameras, and he felt that physiognomy was very important. That the factual details captured by a portrait could relay the essence of the sitter. I have put my, my lens a foot from the sitter's face because I thought when talking intimately, one doesn't stand 10 feet away. We, I want to get to the deeper, most innermost matter. This is the spirit which Stieglitz began his collective portrait of O'Keefe in 1917 and ended in 1937 when he became too infirm to photograph. He made over 300 prints of O'Keefe in the sustained portrait, making images of her body parts almost abstracted to the images of the artist at work and in the gallery. This idea that the whole can only be understood through an accumulation of fact acknowledges the importance of time in modern art. Up close and unadorned, this portrait, a palladium print from the collection of the Metropolitan Museum, represents part of a gift that O'Keeffe made to several museums of Stieglitz's work. The National Gallery in Washington holds the largest number of O'Keeffe portraits as part of an original key set of Stieglitz's work, totaling over 1,600 photographs, including 325 portraits that he made of O'Keeffe. Between June and August of 1918, their very first summer together, Stieglitz made 50 studies of O'Keeffe, a huge number for an artist who had only averaged 12 finished prints per year in the, pre in the preceding decade. Can I have the next slide, please? Oh, sorry. No, I'm going to clip it myself. Oh. Okay. On the left, I'm showing you <clears throat> an image by Gertrude Kazebier called Blessed Art Thou Amongst Women from 1999, 1899, and the right is a print by Annie Brigman called The Breeze of 1918. And these are two of the artists who are in the exhibition. I want to show this to you to, to really as a springboard for how radical Stieglitz's portraits of O'Keeffe really were. Kazebier was the leading female photographer at the turn of the century and like Brigman was adopted by Stieglitz. Kazebier's idyllic image of divine femininity in the domestic sphere was an icon to middle-class educated women. Brigman in Northern California created an imaginary universe populated by idealized nudes in the landscape. Unlike Kazebier, she broke social conventions by creating an eroticized nude in motion, deriving energy from the surrounding natural state. Now, both of these women became very well known um, and sort of as free artists. Kazebier had a huge commercial career and Brigman had a very strong artistic career. And um, you can see that they are very traditional in the way their work both imitates paintings such as the Pre-Raphaelites or Whistler's paintings or Stargent's paintings of the 19th century and uh, Brigman's um, ideas about sculpture and the landscape in a very, very traditional way. So of course, she was risque in that she was showing herself nude or very, very uh, clad, very skimpily clad, but um, in fact, the image looks relatively um, old-fashioned. Um, here I'm showing you two of the portraits that Stieglitz made in this furious first year. On the left, you'll see O'Keeffe's Hands with Pears, 1919, and then on the right, in, in O'Keeffe and Hat before her painting, 1918. Stieglitz had already exhibited O'Keeffe's work in 1916. As with many artists before, Stieglitz once again fashioned a career with exhibitions, essays, and guiding reviews of the work. Many of the photographs of the early years of the collective portrait display O'Keeffe in the public space of the gallery, posed in relation to her own work. In these two images, Stieglitz physically draws a viewer into the space of O'Keeffe's art by placing her hands erotically in relation to the pairs in the drawing on the left. The self-conscious artfulness of this pose actually recalls many of the visual tropes used in Brigman's nudes, staged in poses clinging to trees outdoors. Um, by closing in on the artist's hands, he brings the tools of the creator to the fore. 
In the second image, the hands are still electric with expression. He was eager to show the emotional energy emanating from an artist in a very physical way. Still with this mannish outfit and hat, deadpan staring ahead, O'Keefe avoids any coquettishness that might have been part of the female persona in the work of the pictorialist. <clears throat> And actually, um, when, when these works were shown in the Anderson Gallery in 1921, people commented it in how O'Keeffe looked as if she was actually caressing her own work as, um, as a statement about the power of the female artist. And in fact, Stieglitz wrote often about his idea of keeping O'Keeffe as a very strong female or unisexual presence, and that she was the female creator for the age in his mind. On the left, I'm showing you a drawing, a watercolor by August Rodin, the sculptor, from 1908. And um, on the right, one of Stieglitz's um, news of O'Keeffe from 1918. This is also a platinum print. Um, Stieglitz, in his work in 291, exhibited some of the most avant-garde artists of the day in the small gallery, including uh, Rodin, Picasso, Cezanne, Matisse. And um, we will be looking at how some of the ideas that Stieglitz is trying out in his radical photography series really do emanate from the ideas of the avant-garde. <clears throat> Stieglitz exhibited Rodin's drawing in 1908 and 1910 and published this image in 1911 in camera work. In Rodin and other European modernists, the body becomes a message for artistic freedom and expression of underlying ideas of liberation, both social and intellectual. In his watercolors, Rodin recall, records his model's movement in gestural lines and oblique views which he compiles in cumulative views of a single model. In fact, the way he made these drawings was he had a, the model dance around his studio uh, wearing, wearing some drapes, and he would keep his eye on the model and never take his pen off the page. And uh, we'll be looking at some philosophical ideas about uh, extended time and how you compress extended time in modern art as being very influential to uh, certainly Picasso and Brock, and also to Rodin. The O'Keeffe picture is a platinum print taken as part of the series when Stieglitz was photographing O'Keeffe in his New York apartment. With the white curtain behind and diffused light, he creates a sculptural mass in the foreground, sharp at the edges, but soft overall due to the soft light and the soft graphic textures of the platinum paper. The torso is sexual, but without personal identity in this image, rather a demure classical form. With these news of O'Keeffe made during the war years, Stieglitz is trying to put into practice the artistic values he found in his adventurous galleries. No longer should photography imitate painting, <clears throat> and no longer should photography imitate the textures of painting. Thus, he was on his way to discovering the ideals of quote unquote straight photography. On the left is a, a, a gelatin silver print by Paul Strand called Porch Abstraction from 1915-16. And on the right is a charcoal drawing by George O'Keeffe called Special, 1916. <clears throat> Paul Strand and George O'Keeffe were very powerful influences on Stieglitz in changing his ideas about the role of photography in the world of art. When both these artists entered his circle, debates were raging amongst artists and critics to understanding art and science. Straight photography, or photography of sharp contrast and unmanipulated un prints, was still considered to be very clinical and scientific. Its expressive potential was not yet considered. In 1913, New Yorkers had a taste of the most avant-garde, with Marcel Duchamp showing his urinal on the sculptural podium of the Armory, of the Armory Show. And then Paul Strand was directly influenced by this armory show and by Cubism. An entire issue of camera work was devoted to his very abstract silver prints. Um, unlike the other arts, which are really anti-photographic, said Strand, this objectivity is the very essence of photography, its contribution at the same time its limitation. 
The characteristics of his work, sharply focused, highly detailed images, um, apply characteristics of docu documentary photo genres, travel and portraits, but to create a, a very self-contained abstract image. And um, Strand and O'Keefe had a very close relationship together before O'Keefe came and moved in with Stieglitz. And in fact, it's very interesting how they both arrived at this very abstract, close-up purity of form at relatively the same time. And we'll see that Strand was very influential for um, Stieglitz's work as well. O'Keefe was already part of the Stieglitz circle during her trips back and forth to Texas in 1917 and 1918. In her letter, she expresses her reaction to his work. How much I've liked your work. I've been looking at things and seeing them as I thought you might photograph them. Isn't that funny, making strand photographs for myself in my head? I think you people have made me see, or I should say, feel new colors. On the left, I'm showing you a 1923 image by Stieglitz, and on the right, a 1916 platinum print called Pears and Bowls by Strand. In this comparison, I want to show you how Stieglitz absorbed the lessons of his younger protege in an, in an exercise. Like Strand, he fills the frame, constructing an image of geometric abstractions with the narrative elements in the, horse, in the way he's cropping the horse's reins. Close up, tonal range, textures, all scientific aspects of photography now undisguised and unapologetic. By narrowing the focal plane, all visual information in the image is given equal descriptive capacity. There is no selective focusing on the work. As Strand said, I was in Connecticut, and the simplest of subject matter, or maybe object matter, would be a better term in the case, such as kitchen bowls, cups, plate, pieces of fruit, a table, a chair, the railing, all my material from making experiments to find out what an abstract photograph might be and to understand what an abstract painting really was. So the lessons of Picasso and Brack, Brock dividing um, three-dimensional form into slices of life being seen in 360 degrees and how you um, basically slice up and close in on forms to find the essential meaning of an individual object is really how they apply the lessons of cubism in, this, in both these images. Here's another modernist. Here's Henri Matisse in a sculpture from 1909 called La Serpentine. And here's uh, George O'Keefe holding a sculpture uh, of Matisse's in the 291 gallery. And part of the collective portrait that Stieglitz was very conscious of was really showing O'Keefe as a modernist, as a female who's part of the most avant-garde movement um, and identifying her with the most brazen of European artists being shown in, in the States. Um, here Stieglitz shows O'Keefe in a simple white sheath dress embracing the new art. Matisse's bronze figure very muscular and jaunty, is far from the idealized nudes of the polite photo secession world. Matisse's figure reflects the primitivizing instincts of African sculpture on early Matisse and Picasso. And here is the same sculpture with uh, a 1919 image, probably in the same sheath, made uh, by Stieglitz. And you can really see how Stieglitz captures all of the aggressiveness of this very modern nude that Matisse has. And she's not idealized in any way. She looks, you know, very bored. Uh, she's sticking her hip out, and she's being very aggressive with her body in, in, in an almost impolite way. And Stieglitz has certainly taken the aggressiveness of those elbows and just squished them up in his frame and as if giving her a sort of energy that just bursts out of the frame. And by flattening that close up again, he's taking on this idea of cubism to really um, uh, to piece together what, the, what this character is about. Uh, 
Um, on the right is O'Keefe in bed, 1918. On the left, I'm showing you a sculpture by Constantin Brancusi, Sleeping Muse of 1909-1911. Constantin Brancusi's marble, wood, and bronze abstract sculptures were seen at the Army Show in 1913, as well as in Camera Work magazine. Clearly, Stieglitz was also inspired to make radical, abrupt close-ups, making a study, study of her detached head as a pure form, much as Brancusi did in marble. Now, one thing that Brancusi was very interested in was taking the object as a subject for sculpture and not making a narrative, but really using his materials and showing his materials in a very obvious way, whether it's, it's um, wood or bronze or or marble, and by divorcing the head from the rest of the body, you have just an object that floats in a very otherworldly context and um, has a life of its own. And again, when they were talking about abstraction and modernism <clears throat> in these early days, the idea of concentrating on the object itself, divorced from the narrative context, was very, very important. And the question of how to do that in photography, which itself is a narrative art, was a big problem. And that's why I think Stieglitz and Strand were both so uh, inspired by people working in other mediums who were working on uh, writing and thinking and making things to get out of this problem. Um, now I'm going to show you a series of portrait pics, pictures of uh, O'Keefe in, um, in the studio. Stieglitz applied a very objective and synthetic approach to photographing O'Keefe. He abstracted body parts, studied them under his camera lens with various conditions of lighting and printing in an attempt to reveal intrinsic properties about her through the self-contained study of form. He conceived of this project as a composite portrait, as a compilation of many moments seen through a united work of art. This notion of extended time appeared in a popular philosophical tract called Creative Evolution, written by Henri Berkson in 1907. This was very important work both in France to the Cubists and then in America to all the modernists who heard him lecture in Columbia University, and his work was published also in camera work. Best known was Bergson's notion of vitalism, or élan vital, an underlying rhythm, an inward state, approached intuitively to directly tapping an essential energy <clears throat> that allows us to perceive all things in their native purity. <clears throat> the unconscious mind as a source of creative spirit and matter interacted to compose the creative force. Um, as, as, as Stieglitz wrote, in, um, in camera work, life can only be expressed as duration, la durée. And many abstract pa painters invoked his um, name when discussing how they were making their art. Um, this is a 1919 portrait from the Gettys collection. It's a palladium. Hand portraits, gestures of rhythm and music, trying to give visibility to music and the spiritual underlying form, extending the ideas of Rodin's gestural drawing through this um, cumulative portrait. In 1921, Stieglitz put together a large exhibition at the Anderson Galleries of many of these works. He showed 145 photographs of O'Keefe in the gallery. Now, this was actually before he had given O'Keefe herself a big exhibition. So she became known under the, she became known through these pictures of herself before she became known as an artist in her own right, and that turned into a bit of a problem. Um, he showed, he, he labeled the work in a very odd way. He called it a demonstration of portraiture, and he had different headings, hands, hands and breasts, torso, and a woman. 8,000 people saw this show in seven days while it was on view. He offered, uh, Stieglitz was offered $1,500 for one of the portraits of O'Keefe. She became famous or infamous as the model for the show before her own work was known. Now, criticism of O'Keefe's work was, of course, couched in um, references to the sexual notoriety of these works. The essence of womanhood penetrated her pictures. Marsden Hartley described her abstract compositions as shameless private documents of unqualified nakedness, 
Paul Rosenfeld, another critic, wrote that O'Keefe referred all natural forms back to the grand white surfaces of a woman's body. So when O'Keefe was um, thinking about how to comment on her own work, she really lashed back in a certain sense. And this is um, a little sculpture that she made on the right in 1920. I don't know if it was ever shown, but it's, it's in the, the book of Stieglitz's photographs. And this is one of the Stieglitz photographs on the left. And to me, this is a very uh, aggressive backlash on O'Keeffe's part to how sh she was perceived as purely a sexual object and by making the abstract works that she made, of course, there was great license to interpret them in, that, in those ways. This is one of her um, beautiful abstract paintings from the Plains, 1919. And um, on the right, we see a, a 1920 picture of Stieglitz of O'Keeffe holding a statue that she made. And uh, the statue itself is very interesting. She calls it sculpture abstraction. And um, it's something that she was quite interested in because she then placed it in front of the sculpt this uh, music uh, drawing from 1917, and then Stieglitz photographed it, <clears throat> and he called it interpretation. I think that's quite interesting because it's obviously a very um, aggressively preapic male form, and to me it really counteracts the sort of the womb femininity idea that everybody at the time had with her own art. And I show this, ne I show this to you with Rodin's Balzac statue from 1898 to give you an idea of where sort of these strong abstract forms were coming out of in European sculpture that she really was also herself looking at the modernist. Oops. <clears throat> as O'Keefe said, O'Keefe said, as others had said before her, that Stieglitz was always photographing himself, trying to work out his vision of their relationship and through his printing editing and presentation of images, trying to make O'Keeffe herself into a universal modern woman, into an artwork, an individual tamed under his lens. Um, O'Keeffe and Stieglitz were married in 1924, and they spent much of their time in the summers at Stieglitz's family home at Lake George. And in the 1920s, we see a distinct turn away from European modernism and into Stieglitz's quest to find an American idiom for abstract art. Um, these are some of his very famous pictures of clouds, which uh, were called study, cloud studies in the 19, early 1920s. And by 1929, he began another series of cloud studies called equivalence. And he was really searching for an equivalent of music and pure form in basically a formless narrative subject, the clouds. And he was trying to get away from descriptive content as much as he could, and he felt that by photographing the night sky, he could, he could do that. Um, another distinctly American <clears throat> idiom was found in the cityscapes that they studied together. Here I'm showing you New York Radiator Building at Night 27 by O'Keefe, and this is a 1933 uh, picture from the Shelton Hotel by Alfred Stieglitz. Uh, and I, I want to mention that I think both of them were influenced by each other, and O'Keefe obviously had a very strong influence on Stieglitz and how he was trying to get to a certain purity of form and, and also in finding that American idiom, because once um, once the mid-20s had come and gone, O'Keefe then started going out to New Mexico because she missed the wide open skies and the landscapes of her youth in the Midwest, and she felt very nurtured by uh, nature and the desert. <clears throat> and she would come back, and they would work together and exhibit together during the winter months. And this is... Um, on the left, a 1931 portrait of O'Keefe by Stieglitz holding the cow's skull that she 
brought back with her from one of her trips to Texas, and then her painting, Cowskill with Rose of 1931. And uh, through the years of their relationship, if we think that most of the photographs that are so famous of O'Keeffe were really taken between 1917 and 1925, after that time, O'Keeffe evolved so much more as an independent artist by physically being away from Stieglitz, by being out in the landscape that nurtured her art, and by uh, just maturing as a character who could really stand up to him. And their relationship had deteriorated somewhat by the 1920s. And um, I think in the way Stieglitz looks at her, he's looking at her as her own person at this point in time. Here's a beautiful um, gelatin silver print by Stieglitz of O'Keeffe's hands going back to the creative hands, the close-up, um, caressing her subject. And um, one thing that I should say about the, the photographs I've shown recently, most of Stieglitz's later work are gelatin silver prints and not the softer platinum and palladium prints of the teens and early 20s. And as adopted by Paul Strand and later by Angel Adams and Edward Weston, uh, other photographers whose work who were working at this point in time, the, um, the very sharp contrast and precise detail and richness of the blacks and contrast that you find in gelatin silver became the more um, sought after visual idiom for what was American modernism in photography at this point. And on that note, uh, O'Keeffe was very proud of getting her own car in 1929. And here's a very well-known picture that, uh, that Stieglitz made of O'Keeffe resting her hand on the back of the wheel. And in fact, this looks much more like a machine age precisionist painting uh, straight out of a factory, you know, or glorifying the automobile as it does of an artist making unique objects. And uh, it's very interesting how the, the silver hubcap uh, mirror, mirrors the, the silver very stark bracelet she's wearing and the commanding way she's holding onto this object. And on the right, you see, uh, again, a much more commanding distance view of O'Keeffe at this point in time. Here's another one, a force to be reckoned with, surely. And um, this is, again, 1929. And I think, I think O'Keeffe at this point had really come into her own. Stieglitz was obviously very comfortable making gels and silver prints with small cameras by this point in time and really foregoing the, um, although his prints were always absolutely gorgeous, really forgoing the handwork of his early work and the emotionality of his early work and sort of uh, letting O'Keeffe stand at this point in time for an American idiom that um, really is her legacy. And that's it. Thank you, Lisa. We have time for a few questions, so if you'll just raise your hand, I'll bring the mic to you so that she can hear your question. No questions? Oh, there's one. It's kind of a technical question. You had said that um, his, his later stuff that is silver gelatin was less of his hand was in it. Right, what about? Less of his hand was in it in the silver gelatin work. Is, that, is it because on the, the platinum paper, was that, that had to be made by contact printing, do you know? Or, okay, and then? Well, he also, he also enlarged with platinum paper. Okay, I didn't, I didn't know. And then did they kind of stop making it also, like in the 20s? Um, there were, well, actually, many artists made their own platinum papers, but Stieglitz was very happy using the platinum because uh, there were companies making platinum papers and palladium papers in the teens and the 20s, and he tried them all because he was very interested in, you know, brown tones for this. The, the browner pictures the, I showed were usually the palladium prints, and then the platinum prints are usually the, the pictures that have the uh, very rich middle gray range and less of the high and low end contrast of the gels and silver. But he developed and printed all of his own work, if that's what you mean. Is that what you mean? 
Are you saying you wonder how much of the hand was in the printing? Oh, okay. Sir, did you have a question? Yes. Did uh, Stiglitz had his own gallery in New York, correct? Many galleries. Okay, I didn't realize that. Was was Steichen part owner in the gallery, or they just did photography work together? The first gallery, the 291 gallery, in fact, was set up, I believe, in a building that Steichen owned. And in the, around 1915, at the beginning of World War I, they were working very closely together and, as you saw, photographed each other quite often. Um, I think once Steichen started doing you know, work in Hollywood and all kinds of other things, and then eventually Steichen came to the Museum of Modern Art, um, their paths diverged. But I think that he was certainly one of the supporters of camera work financially, as was Stieglitz, and an owner of the building that the gallery was in. Uh, my question is twofold. Um, one, I wondered if you could expand on um, the problem that existed because O'Keeffe's work was shown as herself in Stieglitz's photographs before she could show her own paintings. And also, I don't know their history. What did happen to them? Um, <clears throat> from what I read, Stieglitz showed her drawings in 1916 before he ever, b without her formal acknowledgement. They were actually brought to him by another art student called Anita Politzer, who was in New York at Teachers College, and O'Keefe had sent these drawings to her. And they had been in and out of 291, but O'Keefe had not formally introduced herself to Stieglitz. And she knew that the drawings were on the wall, and she came in to see them in the gallery and told him to take them down. I mean, she was obviously quite a force to be reckoned with, and that was the beginning of their relationship. <clears throat> She moved permanently to New York to be with him in 1918, <clears throat> having had a, had a fling with Paul Strand in between. And then um, he, Stieglitz, basically left his wife and daughter, who he divorced when the daughter was in college and married O'Keefe in 1924. Now, because he was from a relatively well-off family, he had some personal income, which he had, the, he had been working since 1890s in photography and poured tons of money into all of his um, magazines, subscriptions, galleries, buying work, um, helping the French artists who came here. So he had spent so much money by the time he met O'Keefe that I think the, the personal situation was that he was really beholden to family to find places to live. And so they moved from uh, the brother's apartment, they went up to Lake George, they couldn't be there when the wife was there, that sort of thing. It was pretty messy um, until the wife was really out of the picture and then Lake George became a place that they entertained um, poets and artists and, um, you know, William Carlos Williams and all the art critics and Henry McBride and um, as well as extended family. But um, he was quite the philanderer and was carrying on with lots of other people by the <clears throat> later 20s, his assistants. And by that point, O'Keefe had gotten out of, had gotten out from under the 1921 exhibition of all of her nude photographs because the reception history of her work was really defined by organic forms and feminine bodies for ages. She even tried to get female art critics to write about her work to give it a different perspective, but she wasn't quite happy with them, so she didn't pursue that. Um, and eventually she spent half the year in New Mexico and half the year back uh, at Lake George with Alfred, who died in um, 46, and of course she lived another 40 years. So they had, as the later pictures show, a very different kind of relationship. I think one of mutual respect and support, but you know, not um, from sort of the same intertwined passion that the early pictures show. Thank you very much, Lisa. Yeah.